I want to first of all thank all of our friends from North Carolina and from around the country for being with us today. Give up a big shout for all of them. And when I finish today, I'm going to call three elders up and I want you to honor them. Brother Morales with the Unitarian Church, Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, and Reverend Dr. T. Anthony Spearman. And they have a special piece they're going to do before we all join hands at the end and do something very special with the song. I want all of the NAACP presidents that are out there to raise your hands. All the NAACP presidents, give a shout. All of those who love Morrow Monday. Now they tell me today that this political party launched a website calling us Immoral Monday, Mon Monday, Immoral Monday that has some money from some friends. The media asked me, did I have a response? Yes. When folk can't beat you with truth, they start telling lies. I know they're mad that we got some friends. But we don't just have some friends in organization. We got some friends on high called angels and they're watching over us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, help me with this mic a little. Chapter 12 verse 4. In this, in the Good News translation, the message translation, it says, in this all out match against sin. Others have suffered far worse than you. To say nothing of what Jesus went through, all that bloodshed. So don't you feel sorry for yourselves. Because you have not yet suffered unto blood. You've not yet resisted sin unto blood. Paul found himself having to preach to a people who had seen great victories in the past. But now they were facing great challenges to those victories. And some people wanted to turn back. Some people just wanted to go along, to get along. But the Apostle Paul said, wait a minute. Don't forget how we got here. Tell your neighbor, don't forget how we got here. And then Paul gave a litany of the suffering. He said some were whipped. Some were murdered. Some were cut in two. Some were ruined financially. Some were lynched. But they kept on pressing. The best way they could by faith. Because they knew they were in an all out war. Against sin. And then Paul said something. He said they suffered unto blood. But you and I have not yet had to suffer unto blood. Because we're still here. And then Paul said, when you think about where you've come from, don't ever think about turning back or giving up. We need to hear this today as everything that our foreparents, black and white, who believed in justice and Latino and gay and straight, everything they fought for is under attack. The very Voting Rights Act that people won by risking life and limb throughout the movement and especially in Selma and even here in North Carolina people forget that before Selma cars of Julius Chambers and the president of the NAACP in Newburn, North Carolina were blown up before Selma we're here today on July the 13th, 2015 49 years ago, 11 months and 24 days from the anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act 1965 on August 6th. That Voting Rights Act was signed 100 years after the ending of the Civil War and the ending of slavery. 11 years after Brown versus Board of Education and two years after the March on Washington. 
And almost 30 years after the integration of the armed services where black men and women gave first class blood for second class citizenship. And when President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 65, he said it was a victory greater than any victory we've ever won on any battlefield. But almost 48 years later, on June the 25th, 2013, June 25th, 2013, the same day that in 1773, slaves first petitioned the state of Massachusetts for their freedom. On June 25th, a day that once represented a glorious day in the struggle for liberation, it became a day of infamy. Because on that day, five Supreme Court justices dismantled the Voting Rights Act. And they, in essence, said to Southern legislators, led by extremists like ours, now that your state does not have to worry about pre-clearance, does not have to worry about voting laws being reviewed, you can initiate and inaugurate a new season on voting rights. You can roll back and suppress the right to vote. And since the days of deconstruction in the late 1800s, when Southern Dixiecrats sought to pass and did pass laws that would abridge the rights of the newly free oh black people and undermine their power. Since those days, we've not seen an attack on voting rights and an attempt to abridge the right to vote like we've seen right here in North Carolina. Right here, when in August of 2013, House Bill 589, say it, I don't ever want you to forget it. House Bill 589, that was first filed in the General Assembly on August the 4th, 2013. April 4th, excuse me, 2013. Thank you, the anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And that bill after Shelby on 20, the 25th of June, became the worst and the first voter suppression bill after Shelby. It went from 14 to 57 pages of voter suppression. And they did it without any debate, without any hearings. They nearly passed it and a governor signed it. And when they did, this legislature and this governor instituted another season of what Dr. King called in 63, interposition and nullification against our rights. But now, send that my preacher friends, are the preacher friends out there. The Holy Ghost has been messing with me. And it's time to call it what it is. And I'm going to tell you what it is, what they're doing to voting rights in this democracy. When you try to rob people of their right to vote, when you look at it, it's just sin. It's not merely political conservatism, it's sin. It's not merely public policy changes, it's sin. It's not merely right versus left, it's sin. And our foreparents knew what sin was. That's why they went to church and then they marched and were beaten on bloody Sunday because they were fighting against sin. They knew that the fight for justice is at the core of what it means to be a moral person. The fight for equal protection and voting rights, they knew it was a righteous fight, a moral fight. Our foreparents didn't march because they were Democrats and Republicans. They marched because they were saints of God. They marched because they were moral agents in a mean world. They marched because they were willing to die for the cause of righteousness. When, and when we see the Supreme Court undo voting right, the Voting Rights Act, and then we see the Congress refusing to fix it, and then we see state legislatures and a governor like ours using the absence of preclearance to put in the presence of injustice, it's sin. Now, I'm not just saying this. The Holy Ghost even got on the Supreme Court Justice named Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I read her dissent. 
Uh, I didn't know a Jewish sister could get the Holy Ghost like this. But Justice Ginsburg said in her dissent, hubris. And hubris is the first sin in the Bible. The sin of pride. The sin of arrogance. The sin of idolatry. And she said hubris is a fit word for today's demolition of the Voting Rights Act. She said throwing out pre-clearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. And then usually, usually when a Supreme Court justice renders their opinions, they draw heavily from past court decisions, and Ginsburg did. But then almost as though she was caught up in the zeitgeist. Almost as though she had a chaotic moment. She didn't close with the law of the land. She closed with the law of God. She looked at those Supreme Court justices and said, You might have done what you've done in arrogance, but remember Bloody Sunday. And remember what Dr. King and a good Unitarian said, The arc of the moral universe is long, but it always bends toward justice. In other words, she said what the courts and the extremists have done is sin. And that's why we must call it what it is. What we see happening in North Carolina, what we see happening in other states as it relates to voting rights, as it relates to economic injustice, as it relates to ed cutting education, as it relates to denying health care, they are sins against our Constitution and sins against our deepest religious values. And you know during the movement of the 60s, sometimes the sin would cost people their lives. But whenever that happened, the preachers, sometimes Dr. King, would take to the podium to interpret the blood. As you know, blood talks. But you gotta make sure you got the right interpreter. Governor Haley can't interpret the blood. Oh no, oh no. Some politician that's just trying to find a quick way not to mourn and move on past the situation can't interpret the blood. But Dr. King would go interpret the blood and he would give a prophetic interpretation to death. He would tell us what the blood meant. And that's why at the funeral of James Reed and Jimmy Lee Jackson, Dr. King asked this question. Who killed them? Yeah. Who killed them? Yeah. Who killed them? Was it a lone killer? No, he said, what does the blood say? Yeah. And in essence, he said, in order to honor them, we must leave the ivory towers of learning and storm the bastions of segregation to see to it that what they started continues. Yeah. He said, we must remember the blood. We must remember the blood of Birmingham. Yes, the blood of Charleston. And though they died viciously, they died nobly. Dr. King said they died as martyred heroines of a holy crusade for freedom and human dignity. And then Dr. King would say, whenever folk die fighting for justice, they have something to say to us all. He said they have something to say to every minister of the gospel who has remained silent behind the safe security of your stained glass windows. They have something to say to every politician who has fed his constituents the stale bread of hatred and the small meat of racism. They have something to say. Their death has something to say to us. And I want to conclude here by saying we need this spirit again today. We need to remember that these rights were won by blood. Blood has been shed back then and right now. How dare the Tea Party trample on the blood of our mothers? How dare the Koch brothers with their money try to violate our rights that were written in blood? 50 years after the Voting Rights Act was signed in blood, how dare somebody try to use political power to desecrate the blood of the martyr? How dare they desecrate the graves and the memory and the blood of Martin and Megan? and James Reed and Jimmy Lee Jackson and Viola Russa and four girls in a Birmingham church and nine souls in a Charleston church. We must resist this sin 
because too many have died, too many have suffered, too many have bled. There's too much power in the blood for us to be silent now. So, you want to know why we've come to Winston-Salem? You want to know why this is our, our Selma? We have come to recommit and reconsecrate ourselves back to the movement. We will not let what was won be taken away. America will be America. We will restore the dream. We will never give up our right to vote. We're going to flip what George Wallace said and put it in terms of the blood just as yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because there was, there's power in the blood. It was blood that signed the Voting Rights Act. It was blood that shamed America when it was on the TV cameras. It was blood that forced people to change. There's power in the blood. Somebody tell your neighbor, say, neighbor. Every voting rights came through the blood. Every opportunity came through the blood. Every taste of freedom came through the blood. Every ounce of equality came from the blood. Somebody shout, don't you mess with the blood. The Bible says that the life is in the blood. The blood stirs our souls. The blood brings life to our network marching. The blood, the blood has power to make us stand together. The blood has power to litigate in court. The blood has power to make us march. The blood has power to bring us together. There's power, 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 power. Wonder working power in the blood. We can't give up now. There's power in the blood. We can't sit down now. There's power in the blood. We can't let racism win. There's power in the blood. They can't have our rights. There's power. Dr. Morales has come here in the spirit of James Reed, the Unitarian minister. A white man beat because he had black liberation in his heart. And Dr. Jeremiah Wright, who are going to come to us as elders and say a word. And then we're going to close, hand, hold hands together. And it might trickle a rain. But remember, in Africa, when it rains, it is the sign of God's blessing. God's blessings. Come on, elders, and help us out today. God the Spirit. It gives me great honor today to have been afforded the privilege of sharing with you on behalf of the family of Andrew Goodman, one of the martyrs who was killed as he 
attempted during the Freedom Summer to extend the right to vote to those who did not have it. I want to share a portion of that letter with you that comes from the hand of his brother David Goodman. And please, please let us cherish the memory of Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner. The letter says, Dear Brother Reverend William Barber and all those assembled on this important day, thank you all for your patriotic action to let all of America know that Moral Monday is here to stay as long as necessary. I am sorry that I cannot be with you. Please accept my comments as encouragement for us all. 51 years ago, on June 21st, 1964, my brother Andrew Goodman and his co-workers James Cheney and Michael Schwerner were murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Andy was just 20 years old. James was 21 and Michael was 24. These young men were investigating the burnt remains of the Mount Zion United Methodist Church which was going to be part of the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project to register African Americans to vote. In our New York City apartment a couple of weeks before he left for Mississippi, my brother Andy told me that most African Americans in Mississippi were denied their constitutional right to vote by state-sanctioned segregationists. My brother said that was just unfair and he wanted to do something about it. So he joined the Freedom Summer Project as a volunteer. Approximately 100 black leaders and 1,000 mostly white volunteers collectively participated in Freedom Summer 1964, one of history's most effective nonviolent social actions. Our brothers' lives were stolen because of this systemic oppression that has been with us hundreds of years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence and is still with us today. It creates a huge divide between that glorious ideal of all people are created equal and our everyday practices. This is the dilemma that has long bedeviled America. On June 21st, 1964, at 17 years old, I became witness to the hatred that oppression engenders. It changed the course of my entire life. But the story of Goodman, Cheney, Schwerner is not my story alone. It's the story of we the people. We the people can never be defeated when we stay united. As I look out at our diverse faces, I am extremely inspired as one who was only 13 years old when Swerner, Cheney, and Goodman were killed. Their, their death is etched in my memory, and I say to us today, we have to continue to move forward together and not take one step back. Forward together. Forward together. On behalf of the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, standing for justice, we join nationally and internationally with you. I say today, racing the storm, what I said last night and what I said the day after the nine martyrs of the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church were killed. 48 years ago, Dr. King named the demon we fight. Yes, he did. He said it was called racism. Ah. Racism is the foundation upon which the voter suppression movement has been built. Those of you who have any friends or loved ones who have ever been in the 12-step program know 
And one of the principal tenets of the program is that you cannot tame the demon unless you can name the demon. Dr. King named that demon for us. He named it. 48 years later, you stand here today. We stand together to say we're going to tame the demon. Let's give it up for our elders. Now, all of you that are at least 65 and older, raise your hand. Give it up for them, y'all. Give a big scream. All of you, all of you that were not there in 65. No man, no weapon Formed against chest glory is destined Everyday women and men become legends Fears that go against our skin become blessings The movement is a rhythm to us Freedom is like religion to us We thank God for our humanity All in the people of Mr. Salem Woman and 